Buenas tardes, bonsoir, good afternoon, and welcome to the, our attendees for this third session about uh, our webinar on Blue Innovation in ORs. This third session is the last, and we will uh, two interesting talks uh, about uh, diversification in aquaculture and another about conservation. So just for start, we will introduce uh, Dr. Um, Gerson Courtois de Bissois, which is here with us, and we'll present a talk about diversification in uh, IMTA. Thank you, Arson. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Fran. Um, Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where is your location. Uh, today the presentation would be on different uh, sustainable aquaculture production methods in outermost region and uh, the interest of diversifying the aquaculture species being produced through a low trophic species. So just to put things in context, uh, when we talk about outermost regions and OCTs, for the most of them, they are islands and they represent uh, together the world's largest uh, economical exclusive zone, which is about 50 million of square kilometers. Uh, to talk about ORs and OCT, generally they have a lot in common in the sense that they have a high marine biodiversity, uh, they present huge potential and are keys for blue economy activities. And generally in these uh, regions, their economic activities rely mostly on tourism, services and a few primary production uh, that are taking place. They normally have small domestic markets which means that they need to also import a large quantity of food to sustain uh, local consumption. And um, normally their insularity means uh, longer distance to reach markets, and that means additional cost for supply and export of any production taking place in these different locations. So therefore there is a need for the sustainable development of these islands, and one of the things could be through the fostering food production. Um, moreover, this food production can possibly be associated to uh, other types of production, other types of activities or services, and that could, brings, could bring additional economical development. Um, we all know that aquaculture is an essential part of the European blue economy strategy. Therefore, there is an interest to consider aquaculture to increase the to increase the sustainable development of these islands uh, in order to increase their food security, in order to diversify their economical activities and to create jobs. But although aquaculture can be developed, there is also a need to valorize and promote aquaculture activities and their products, and also to promote the image of aquaculture. So therefore there is a need to diversify uh, the species being produced in aquaculture through sustainable production techniques that are respectful of the environment and that, uh, that can also contribute to restorative function, better management of existing stocks and also in sometimes can contribute to protect endangered species. Therefore, uh, for the development of aquaculture in ORs and OCT, there is an interest to look for uh, emblematic, attractive species uh, that are regionally distinct, that could be certified also, that have qu high quality, high value, that can respond to specific niche market, and that can be sustainably produced and environmentally compliant. Um, this could foster um, the development of responsible aquaculture under an ecosystem approach in overseas regions, taking fully into consideration the intrinsic local characteristic of each of these territories. So what do we mean by that? Normally when we talk about aquaculture for food production, what is the first thing that comes in mind uh, to many people? That's what comes in mind, aquaculture through fish production mainly. But then 
Mm, it's uh, the, the number of people that are thinking about uh, other species when they think aquaculture then suddenly diminish because many people don't think about uh, the filter feeders, the extra extractive species such as oyster, for example, or mussels. Rarely people think about aquaculture considering uh, the production of microalgae or the production of macroalgae. Then even more uh, <laughs> uh, rarely, people are thinking about using um, aquaculture as an environmental instrument, such as the production of tridacna, for example, or abalone, in order to um, develop some receding programs. Um, and then also, apart from uh, these species, I mean, people don't always consider the production of pearl oyster as aquaculture, which is, or the quinconch. And these are all, or the corals that are being used now in order to start rebuilding reefs. And people don't consider this or rarely consider this as aquaculture, but this is part of the aquaculture activities that can take place. Another thing that people also don't think about is that, that the, the fact that aquaculture can be associated with other activities, with other uh, sectors, such as, for example, the design of wind farms uh, associated with the uh, integrated multitrophic aquaculture that includes fish, shellfish, and macroalgae production. And so this de uh, demonstrates the possibility to integrate the aquaculture activities with other activities that are taking place. So here we're going to talk about an example of uh, a sustainable aquaculture initiative that has taken place here in uh, the Canary Islands through the integration uh, of low trophic species, especially in integrated multi-trophic aquaculture system. So what is an IMTA? I mean, what is IMTA, Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture? It's the um, integrated production of fed species together with extractive species, okay? And this is um, for the, the ability to use the organic and inorganic nutrients that are being generated by the fed species. So therefore, it usually utilizes the ecosystem services provided by, by organisms of low trophic uh, levels in order to mitigate the effects of organisms that are produced at higher trophic levels. So the idea of IMTA is to recycle food and energy to increase sustainability and profitability of the aquaculture industry in general. So IMTA, again, this is like a general sketch that has been done by Thierry Chopin, and uh, the idea is to recover the lost nutrients that are coming from one trophic level in order in, into biomass that can be harvestable and that can be used or consumed by humans or by other uh, species. Therefore, the waste become products and resources. And this also enables to ensure that the nutrient loading stays within the assimilative capacity of a localized ecosystem. So in order to develop the kind of IMTA uh, system, um, there is a need to select the organism, first according to their different trophic level, also to their economic, uh, economical value or potential to be included in such a system, and um, to ensure that they are integrated, that one species is going to benefit from the nutrients that are being produced by another uh, trophic level. So. An example that we've started here is with the uh, land-based integrated multitrophic aquaculture of Aliotis tuberculata and abalone with uh, Oloturia sanctori, a sea cucumber, and macroalgae. So um, the first step uh, in order to develop a new species or a new production system is to select the candidate species. In that case, we selected the abalone first, the Aliotis tuberculata. This species has to be selected according to um, the uh, administrative framework or regulatory framework to make sure that they are enabled to be produced in the region where they're going to be produced. Uh, in our case, the abalone was um, uh, interesting due to its high added value and to its low trophic level. Lately, in the system, we've integrated Oloturia sanctori uh, due to its geographical location. It was locally present in the Canary Islands. 
Um, it's also on some of the on the list of the species that are uh, being uh, submitted to increasing catches in the Mediterranean and the uh, Atlantic as they have an increasing interest as commercial species. And uh, for these species, for the Oloturia sanctuary, its aquaculture production has not started yet, so there was an interest to um, in further investigate the production of this uh, sea cucumber species. Another thing in order to um, develop a new species or a new system is to look at the broodstock conditioning, uh, the larval culture, and the uh, possibility to produce spats. Okay, so therefore we've worked on the use of uh, different uh, larval uh, production techniques and uh, especially settlement induction techniques in order to increase our uh, settlement induction in order to, to have a regular uh, um, supply of spats that can be uh, then further used for grow out. So now we have a control spat production Lately, we've started to look at the reproduction and larval production of Oloturia sanctori, and up to date, we've been able to look at the embryonic and larval development, and we have not reached the settlement phase yet in order to obtain juveniles, so that's the next step where we're going to continue working on. Um, and then finally, we go to the grow out technology. So for the grow out technology, uh, we've integrated the, the IMTA system integrated the macroalgae production, Gracilaria and Ulva. And we've looked at the different uh, effects of culture condition on the macroalgae nutritional quality, and therefore consequently on the effect they will have on the growth of Oloturia, of um, Aliotis tuberculata, and indirectly this on the growth of uh, Oloturia sanctori. This in order to close the loop and produce uh, in systems that could be environmentally compliant. So the fast, fast grow of abalone was observed with a mixed uh, Ulva gracilaria species being produced in, uh, in uh, Imta. So the um, sea cucumber were integrated below the abalone that were fed with these macroalgae. And um, in the different trials that were performed, uh, we've observed that the density of sea cucumber that were integrated in the system were crucial for um, their growth because um, at higher density, the animals um, had a negative growth, whereas it was the contrary at lower density. So the density is really important for their integration. And also the source of feed that was being used for the abalone also had an effect on the growth of the sea cucumber and on their ingestion. So all these are um, experiments that need to be uh, further developed in order to um, find the uh, correct ratio in the system and to adapt the feeding strategy so that they can be beneficial for all the different low trophic species that are included in the system. These systems were tested on land and at sea. Uh, in both systems, we've reached uh, uh, the commercial size, which is higher than 45 millimeters, in around 12, 18 to 22 months. And uh, this allowed us to produce a growth curve and, um, and to estimate uh, the production that could be produced in, in such amount of time. And in both systems, we've also noticed the density effect, uh, which is crucial in such type of uh, production. And so, overall, what are the benefits of producing uh, low trophic species in such integrated system? Well, it offers us uh, the ability to have a diversity of food products. Um, it also allows us to have specimens that can be used for reseeding programs in case of species that uh, are endangered or that are which stocks are declining. And it also offers the possibility to use these species for other uses than, than food. I mean, it can be ornamentals, it can be jewelry, it can be additional um, products that can be uh, used in, with such aquaculture system. Um, actually, how or uh, within which project we've developed uh, this uh, latest experiment. 
Uh, we've done some of the experiment in um, case studies that are dedicated to integrated multi-trophic aquaculture taking place along the uh, along and across the Atlantic, and this is through the Aquavite European project. So here we are collaborating with uh, partners that are located in South Africa or in France, where we're exchanging on the, the results of such production systems. And uh, we were also setting up um, a network uh, at the Macaronesia re regional level uh, in which we are collaborating with Madeira and uh, Azores in order to promote and develop a sustainable, integrated and innovative aquaculture in the Macaronesian region uh, to promote the production of marine invertebrates that could have a commercial interest. So that includes uh, sea urchins, uh, limpets, uh, sea cucumber, abalone, and all these being low trophic species that can be produced in an integrated way. So uh, generally, or to conclude, um, what would be the valorization of sustainable aquaculture? Well, the idea is that although it's one um, production, uh, it can be associated with other sectors or other activities. And in order to have environmentally compliant production system that can contribute to economical development, but also uh, maintain traditional activities, facilitate training, and of course, uh, further develop the research in, in uh, such a system. So the idea is to integrate the aquaculture with other uh, activities, and also, but this always maintaining the environmental um, aspects uh, really um, clearly focused. And that would be the conclusion of uh, the, this um, low trophic aquaculture. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Asun, for this excellent presentation, summarizing probably 20 years of work, <laughs> excellent work. Uh, we have already some questions. As you may know, um, the questions will be at the end, will be responded, uh, answered at the end of the session. Just. A quick, um, a quick reflection. Yesterday we have a, a presentation about the diversification of aquaculture, uh, about fast-growing species. Today we have another one, which is another level, probably also adapted to the island environments. Mm -hmm. And I think in the, in, in the context of uh, food security, uh, probably, as, as you know, in the recent times we have some problems with the pandemic situation. I think this kind of approach could be really useful for this kind of environment. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you yeah. again for your time. Okay. No problem. And then we will jump to conservation. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. So the next speaker is disappear now from the room, <laughs> but he will come shortly, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, I have s yes, probably will come soon. Uh, just. Uh, to tell you the the plan of the for the for the um, for the session after this uh, conservation talk about uh, ecosystem services in uh, subtidal habitats, we will have a roundtable about uh, about the conclusion or summarizing the talks that we have during these days. So the next speaker is among us now. I will introduce uh, the Dr. Uh, Fernando Tuya. Uh, who is working in the group of biodiversidad and conservation uh, from the Eco Aqua Institute? Uh, Fernando, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for having me in. Great pleasure to be here. And in my talk today, basically, what I'm going to do is to summarize different results, different out outcomes that we, in, in our research group here at the University of Las Palmas, have been t carrying out in the last couple of years. The title of my talk is An Overview of Ecosystem Services Associated with Subtitle Habitats in the Outermost Region. So I'm, I'm going to particularly use sea grass meadows as a case study, um, as a case study in the Canary Islands. So 
we all love nature, and we as ecologists try to um, try to develop models, for example, and concepts. For, for example, the concept of ecosystem to study how organisms and the environment interact, right? How the different processes can fuel um, uh, food chains and the way uh, different organi uh, organisms in interact with each other. Um, we, we somehow need to come up with easy uh, definitions, easy concepts that try to encapsulate different uh, ecological, ecological uh, concepts. Uh, for example, we can use the concept of ecosystem services, which basically are, um, as, you can, as you can see in the imagine, we can uh, conceptualize four types of uh, ecosystem services as regulation services, habitat services, supply services, and uh, cultural uh, services. So basically, what ecosystem services are is like a common language between different type of people so we can understand to each other. So basically, when we talk about ecosystem services, we can, we can consider these four big um, uh, types. Um, for example, if we consider a, a, a seagrass meadow or a, fo or a forest, we can take into consideration the provision of the support of biodiversity because it's going to provide a habitat for associated uh, um, biodiversities. But at the same time, it's, uh, an ecosystem is going to regulate a whole range of mechanisms and processes, for example, provision of primary productivity, secondary productivity, and so on. So we basically can the different mechanisms and the different processes that take part in an ecosystem can be conceptualized into these four big uh, broad, um, broad uh, areas, right? At the end, we, we are aiming is at providing a monetary assessment, uh, uh, um, a financial assessment of these uh, s uh, services. Why? Because as I said before, we, we, we are trying to come up with a common language, with a non-technical language between different uh, parts of the society, managers, uh, politicians and society in general, so we can understand uh, to each other. It's, of course, it's, it's, it can be, it can be a, sometimes a little bit difficult and uh, problematic to, to provide a natural capital with a, with a monetary segment, but as I said before, this is going to provide a, a common language, a non-technical language between we ecologists or scientists with different compartments of the society, as for example, uh, managers, uh, stakeholders, NGOs, um, the, in general, society. Uh, ecosystem service services are uh, very fashionable. They have been uh, in, the, in the scientific literature, they have been in the last two decades, there has been a massive amount of scientific work dealing with, with ecosystem services. And in turn, for example, there is a, a brand new uh, journal by the um, uh, Elsevier, who basically deals with ecosystem services and the way they can be estimated, different applications to, to different cases, scenarios, and so on. So as I said before, it can be difficult, it can be sometimes tricky, but at the end, it's gonna provide a common languages, a common language between different uh, stakeholders, so we all can uh, understand to each other. It's important to understand that ecosystem services are always going to be underpinned by ecological functions. So if we want to describe and we want to economically valorize any ecosystem service, the first step is to define uh, ecosystem function. So for example, in a seagrass ecosystem, that is the, the habitat I'm going to talk today as a case study, we can, we can describe, for example, the primary product, fr pr uh, productivity of the seagrass, which is also going to, for example, provide an, an habitat and secondary pr production for a, a, a whole range of animals. The plants are going to, to oxygenate the environment, so it's gonna produce oxygen, it's gonna recycle all the nutrients, it's gonna contribute to sediment stabilization. So at the end, we, ha we have a whole range of ecosystem processes, ecosystem uh, functions that, as I said before, they are going to underpin ecosystem services. So if we want to, economically valor, valorize or estimate ecosystem services, the first step is always going to be to understand the ecosystem functions. So in, as I said before in my talk of today, as a case study um, uh, system, I'm going to uh, talk about three ecosystem services around seagrass meadows created by this beautiful plant. This is Saimodosia nodosa in, in the Canary Islands. 
which is a foundation species that is going to, cre to create very large sized meadows, not only in the, in the Canaries, because this species is also distributed across the entire Mediterranean and the Western African coast all the way down to Senegal, including Madeira and, uh, and uh, the Canary Islands. So the three ecosystem services that I'm going to show you, um, basically briefly how to methodologically get a value of them, are going to be the three ecosystem services that I've got here in the, in the screen. Uh, first of all, I'm going to speak about the blue carbon capacity that this ecosystem uh, have. Then I will pass to another ecosystem service. This is supply. Uh, sub this this would be a regulation ecosystem services, and these two other are uh, supply ecosystem services. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how economically um, uh, estimate the fisher value of seagrass meadows in the, this particular case in Gran Canaria Island, and I will do exactly the same for the production of free biomass. Right. Okay, let's, let's pass and let's have a look to the first ecosystem service that I'm going, going to speak today, which is the world right now as a blue carbon, right? Because seagrasses are photosynthetic organisms, they basically are going to capture carbon, right? And they are going to bury organic carbon in the below ground compartments, basically, as you can see here, in all the all the roots and the rhizomes that connect the different, the different, uh, the, um, different parts of, 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 a of a plant. So basically when we, we refer to blue carbon, is this carbon that is stored in all these below ground compartments, right? And because there is very low oxygen, right, very low oxygen, the degradation of this organic carbon is, very, is going to be very, very low. So there's going to be a lot of carbon that is going to be stored in the sediment, that is going to be buried in these sandy, sandy sediments. So it's very easy to somehow uh, estimate the, the value of this ecosystem. How? Well, in the sense that we only, can, we, we only have to go to the field, collect couple of different samples and by using a loss of ignition technique which is very easy which we just need to cut down with a saw the different the different uh, samples and, and use an oven we basically can using some mathematical formulas we can finally estimate the carbon uh, stocks of a couple different seagrass meadows and first of all what we can do is to compare which are these carbon stocks relative to another species, but what is more important is that we can have, we can have this carbon stock at some particular local middle. And have a look to the units of, this, of these values. We are referring to the amount of carbon stored per hectare, right, for different, for different meadows, because different meadows have different ecological complexities, they have different densities, they have different biomasses, they are located at different depths and so on. We are going to step a whole range of different values, okay? Keep in mind that these values tend to be very similar, but they fluctuate even at one order of magnitude from one side to side. Why? Because as I said before, the environmental scenarios of each of these meadows are going to be completely different. What is important is that by taking advantages of different self sampling in different meadows, we can come up with a value for the entire island. For example, across the entire Gran Canaria island, we estimated, we estimated the mean carbon stock per hectare, right? So if we now take advantage of a cartography of the entire distribution of the seagrass across the entire island, Right? We can multiply this value, this mean value, by this uh, value, which is the amount of hectares that the seagrass is distributed across the entire island perimeter. We can finally estimate this value here, which is the total amount of carbon that meadows dominated for, by Simodosia and Odosia are bearing here in Gran Canaria Island. One step further, we can multiply this value right, this value, by the economic value in terms of euro of each chunk of carbon to come up with this final value, which is one million and a half euro. So basically at the end, we come up with a really nice value that everybody can understand. And is that the value 
of the blue carbon provided by Simodosia nodosa across the entire island perimeter of Gran Canaria uh, adds up to more than one million, uh, one and a half million euro, right? So we finally get this value. If we want to do this in another island, in another geographical area, we just have to follow exactly the same methodology, right? So we can easily export this methodology to other locations where we can get these uh, seagrass meadows. It doesn't have to be uh, underpinned by Simodosia nodosa. It can be underpinned by whatever seagrass meadow we find in different locations, right? Okay. All right. So um, seagrasses are more than carbon factories. They play different roles in addition to sequestering or absorbing the carbon. So as I said before, they are going to provide a beautiful habitat, a great habitat for a whole range of uh, organisms. For example, fish, right? And we can get fish that are commercially in interesting. Uh, for example, this is the goldfish, or this is a species of seabrain, which can be eat uh, eaten, but at the same time, they can provide a habitat, for example, for activities that are relevant for a naturistic perspective, for example, recreational diving, and we can find we can find this species of fish. So, as we, as we did before with the blue carbon, we can somehow develop some routines, some strategies to economically valorize, evaluate, eh, um, which is the value that these seagrass meadows have in terms of, for example, fishing, right? This would be, this would be the, the, the first point. So we can go out there to, a, to different seagrass meadows, and as, and as before, we can estimate, for example, how many fish, which is the biomass of fish, inhabiting different types of seagrass meadows, and we can come up with some really nice, uh, really nice uh, values. For example, the mean number of species that in a seagrass meadows is about five, it's, about, it's around six, and um, we basically get one fish per square meter of seagrass meadows. Keep in mind that this is, this is the mean value for the entire Gran Canaria Island, so it's about 95 fish per 100 square meters. So it's basically one fish per, per square meter. So if we know the amount, the abundance of fish, we can estimate the volume mass of fish. We can work out how many fish have we got in different seagrass meadows, right? If we also have a cartography, as we saw before, of, of how the seagrass meadows are distributed across the entire island perimeter, and we know the market prices of the different species, we finally can come up with a value that is a little bit above 1 million euro that represent how much, huh, which is the value, which is the economic value of all those fishes that are inhabiting seagrass meadows, right? If we estimate that half of this biomass is going to be fish, is going to be harvest through both artisanal or recreational fish, fisheries every single year, we come up with a final value of about half a million euro, right? That the seagrass meadows are providing in just in terms of fishing, right? We go there and we extract this biomass, right? Of course, but in seagrass meadows, if one of you take a mass and go to a seagrass meadows, you are going to work out that more of the fish are tiny, and very, very small. These are, for example, the size distribution of the different species. If you have a look here, they are all very, very tiny and very small. And this is because seagrasses across the entire planet play a key nursery function. And this means that most of the fish that we find in seagrass meadows are small, are, recru are recruits, right? They are getting there, getting there because they've, they've got shelter and they've got a lot of food. So yeah, they are going to develop their, the first stages of their, of, their, of their life cycle, right? And in turn about, for example, in the Canary, here in the Canaries, our data say that 95% of the fish that we see in a seagrass meadow are recruits, right? So something that we can come up is to estimate the value of the production of that value mass, because these recruits are going to grow and are going to enter local fisheries, right? Artisanal or recreational. So just by using, again, different mathematical algorithms, for example, in, this case, in that case, we can use the allometric re relationship for one species. I'm using just an, as, as an example the parrot fish by, consider, by considering the size distribution that, we've, that we get in a particular moment in a particular seagrass meadow, we can 
by using, as I said before, I'm not going to show you how, by using a couple of different mathematical organisms, we can estimate just for one species, in this case for the parrot fish, which is the value of the production of this biomass per year, right? And this is done just for one species, in that case, the parrot fish, because it's an iconic, all right, an iconic uh, fish for the local cuisine, for the, for the ecology of the, of the canaries. But we can do that for the whole range of species that are recruiting on seagrass meadows, right? Right? In this particular case, we, we managed to demonstrate that the value of this, the production of this, of this uh, the value of this fish production per year is about, for just one species in Gran Canaria Island, a little bit more than 50,000 euros. Right? And we can do this for maybe 30, 40 species that recruit in, in the middle. Right, so why, why is all of this important, right? Basically, I'm going to show up to direct applications, right? First of all, this information can be very important, can be very important for uh, managers working with marine and spatial planning. For example, we want to priorize areas of conservation, right? This is something that every day can be done. So we can translate these ecosystem services. If we have a cartography, right? We can get the value of the different ecosystem services and we can create layers for every single service. For example, here, I've, I'm presenting for two islands, the south of Tenerife and the south of, of Gran Canaria, how, which is the economic, the potential economic uh, value of the fish nursery function. So, you can see that there are places here in red color, and other places are in blue, and so on. This means that the value, for example, of the red color, means that these place, places are going to be more economically um, important than, for example, the blue areas, right? And we can carry out this for every single ecosystem service. So at the end, a policymaker or a manager can have these layers and can prioritize areas for conservation, right? So in terms of, of management, these, these tools can be, can be very, very interesting. Another potential application of this uh, ecosystem services jargon is that we can estimate what happens, for example, when there are phase shifts or transitions from one ecosystem to another ecosystem. For example, in, the, in this case, we detected that in Gran Canaria Island, seagrass meadows were replaced by bonos dominated by green seaweed, by green vegetation. Seaweeds are not the same as seagrasses. So we basically managed to estimate which were the erosion rate in the provision of different ecosystem services. For example, when a seagrass meadow is replaced by a bottom dominated by green seaweed, net primary production is going to be eroded 1.5 times. And the same for the abundance of apifauna, the, bond, the abundance of small, uh, small sized fish, uh, large fish, and so on, right? So again, these provide managers, right, with an estimation of how different ecosystem services, the value of these ecosystem services can change when a habitat transitions from one state to another state, right? And with this, I finish up my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando, for this brilliant presentation. Uh, I will also thank you to give this new approach to do conservation based on perhaps sometimes a very simple way to, uh, to, uh, to present the, the value of the ecosystems. But I think it's something that is perhaps already implemented in the terrestrial environment, but it's quite new for marine. So thank you very much for this, this work. Uh, so now we will pass to the last presentation. It's a kind of summarizing presentation that we will presented by uh, the head of the Coaco Institute, the Professor Ricardo Arun Tabrawe. And the title is about ERA in situ labs proposal to foster capacity building and scientific knowledge on marine biodiversity and conservation in the outermost region. Uh, Ricardo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. 
it's a pleasure for me to try to, I will not say Sumerai, but have an overview of the potentials and, and possibilities that uh, Audemars region have for different <coughs> aspects on, on marine conservation and management of, of marine resources. From the, for the last uh, three days, we have been uh, um, presenting or discussing about different topics that are related to the, to the blue growth. And blue growth is an important issue now in, in all the members of state of the European Union. And Audemars region are not far away from that. On the contrary, Audemars region have a lot of marine area. They have a lot of uh, surface uh, maritime areas that can be used for diverse activities, um, maritime sectors, from tra maritime traffic, from tourists, from renewable energies, from marine conservation, of course, and from sustainable aquaculture, from many, many different sectors that are becoming more and more relevant in the economy of the local um, regions. And I think in the, in the project forward, we are trying to reinforce the value of the locations. I'm going to speak more about what are the positive things we have in the, in the Audemars region, what are the, the positive, the strengths, the possibilities that we have in the Audemars region for not only for the local uh, community, but also as a ERA European Research Area uh, members or even at an international level. We are located in three different oceans. We are, we are having large uh, marine surface and there is a lot of potential for reinforcing the science and the connection of the local communities, the local research community with the, with the other European centers. <clears throat> so with this introduction, I will try to smile. Well, this is a, becoming quite, quite common now. Those are the development goals from the United Nations. And again, all the most region are a perfect places, are um, really wonderful places to, to implement or to test most of these development goals. Uh, we have different population uh, structure, we have uh, different geographical setting, of course, and number of uh, resources that are exploited or over-exploited, or even we have some impacts, so we, we think there is a lot of opportunity in the Audemars region to develop and to implement these uh, development goals. Uh, in the previous day, we were having some examples of networks, of activities that have been or are being developing in the Audemars region with the recipes, for example, about a circular economy or aquaponic or the Rebecca that is also trying to foster more close relationship among the people working on microalgae and apply results from microalgae. So I think we, are, we have already started to have those type of uh, collaborations, networking with other Audemars region. Uh, mainly, mainly, I would say, in between Madeira, um, Azores, Madeira, and the Canary Island, but there are some aspects, and forward is probably one of the very important project uh, that uh, we can also implement more relationship or more uh, fostering, promoting more activities, not only in the Macaronesian area, but also through the Caribbean and also through the, to the Indian Ocean uh, regions. So, for example, this is a em Embris is European Marine Biological Resource Center. It's a compilation or a network of already existing of different uh, research uh, centers in, in Europe, in continental Europe. Recently, the um, Banco Español of Algae is part of that uh, network, and I think it will be possible for many other research centers in the Ademos region to become member of that uh, network. So that's, that's probably one of the um, pathway or future action that could be implemented. So, as I say, I'm trying to um, recover again the, the motto of the, 
of the forward. We try to reinforce, we try to promote, we try to implement a better integration of the research center, local research centers that sometimes are isolated or have very few expertise on some aspects, but they have a very good expertise on one or two key issues that are not the same level in the in the rest of Europe. That's for, for sure. So we can we can take advantage of that and trying to implement that for reinforces the, the, the value of uh, our demos region of, of uh, as I said before, um, suitable or or perfect playground for developing blue growth uh, strategies. I give you some example, just and it's not a complete, it's just some ideas that uh, maybe later in the in the discussion time we can increase or discuss some of the topics. These are, for example, from the biological, just from the biological point of view, some of the keystone or, or fundamental species, let's say that way, or the structural ecosystems that are really relevant in the different um, geographical setting we are talking about. Not, not, it's, they are, not all of them are located in, in the Canary Islands, I would say. They're, not all of them are located in Guadalupe, but each, in each of the regions, we have certain value or certain habitat or species that deserve more, more research or that we can implement our study on that for marine conservation, but also for sustainable use, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Fernando Tuya was mentioning before about the ecosystem service. That's also important. Uh, so this is just, an, again, that the others, the previous slide was more about the from the biological perspective, this is more from the ecological perspective. So we need to, we, we can think more about the function and structure of the habitat. Remember, we are in, we are biodiversity hotspot and most of our places are tropical and subtropical. A lot of people in Europe, a lot of people of the United States will love to do some research on our locations. So we, we can really, uh, I'm not going to sell, but going, we can really take advantage of, of our position as a tropical and subtropical setting for many of those uh, ecological processes or for the biological or marine conservation activities. So these are some examples, as I said before, these are not uh, complete, it's just some, some ideas for the, for the discussion among the, among the audience here, uh, present here or, or online just to see how we can uh, <clears throat> take advantage of the, our situations. Also, in the previous day, we were, some of these uh, technological um, approaches were, were described or were presented, and I think there are many more possibilities over there for supporting sustainable growth and again, the United Nations uh, Development Goals, Sustainable Development Goals in the in the Andamos region. So we do have some knowledge, we do have some expertise, and we can increment that uh, that uh, know-how with uh, networking with among us, and also with the European centers. I give you two examples that are actually running. One is is in, in Europe, in mainland, with only two places outside Europe, that's Eilat in Israel, Las Cruces in, that's in Chile, in the Pacific. So this is a, another example of a assembly that is working in, in mainly in mainland with researchers, young, young PhD um, students or, or cooperation with other countries outside, even outside the continental Europe. So that's, it's already working, and we, I think we can, we can take uh, that as a potential example for our, for our situation in the Audemos region. And the other one is uh, Aqua Excel. We are now in the Aqua Excel 3.0, that's the third edition, and again, it's a network of uh, excellent center developing aquacultural research in different places around the Europe. Here, the Coaqua Institute has, is also part of that Aqua Excel, and we have a lot of uh, transnational action. That means that uh, younger researchers or 
joint projects or activities carried out by people from research center or from companies in Europe or even outside Europe can use the facilities and implement some of the new techniques or new research approach or new methodological approach as we were talking today also for the local situation. So I'm just finishing the talk and trying to summarize a little bit. So from my perspective, I'm working with the thematic working group A on marine science and technology. We have a very, very um, clear position and, and I would say very positive uh, situation to develop a network of research centers supported by specific European fund. I haven't found, I haven't defined a which fund and I think in the network of, of, of forward we have a, quite a lot of very good uh, um, regional um, representative, government representative from, let's say, from Arditi, from Assisi in Canary Island, from Nexa in Reunion, from Synergil, from Fondo Regional de Ciencia Tecnología in the Azores that are somehow connected to the to the regional governments and they can improve or define pro more properly which are the potential tools or potential uh, funding agencies, DigiRegio or any other sources that we can implement to foster this excellence in, in research in, and innovation in blue growth. I, of course, the topic of our webinar today, or these three days were about marine resources, the diversity and conservation and expo sustainable exploitation, but I think we are open for more activities. Maybe the renewable energy is another issue that's maybe inter renewable marine energy is another issue that is becoming more and more relevant in the other, in different settings. But uh, as I said before, for me it's, it's quite relevant that uh, this type of network will facilitate, increase, promote, and try to develop uh, um, laboratories, places, areas where young scientists, new people coming in the, in the, in the career or joint projects developed by the local institutions and the continental institutions may develop the, the young actions and, the, and promote, let's say, new technologies, new products, new marine biotechnology products or new aquaculture species or new circular economy and approach, different actions that may be developed through this uh, network of uh, uh, research centers. And just a reminder, um, again, we have a very nice opportunity. We are in the United Nations decade of the ocean, and I think we have to take uh, this message also to our politicians in the sense that Audemars region are perfect place for developing this type of actions. They are very good area for and we have diversity, we have, as I said before, we have diversity of population, we have diversity of geographical settings, um, economic activities, more, some of them are more related to agriculture, some of them are more related to the tourists or to fishing. So these are different settings that we can take uh, as a um, playground, as a very important place for not only for the people in the Canary Island, that we have already done several, several projects in, in the Ecoaqua and the University of Las Palmas with European partners or the people in Madeira in the soil, but as a general, the Audemars region, I would say, needs to focus more on a joint action like this network of living labs uh, that, can be, that can be implemented through the national or regional uh, government institutions. Uh, I... I'm finishing here, but I would like to say that, uh, well, my main concern is more about the marine um, marine science, but uh, in the forward project, we do have other thematic working group that may take also this uh, uh, concept of a living lab for developing other activities. I would say climate change, for example, it's not only about the marine environment. Climate change is affecting agriculture, it's affecting maritime traffic, they're affecting many other things in the Ademos region. So perhaps this living lab concept that started from the from the marine 
perspective it could be enlarged and bring some other some other thematics or some other topics aside from the from the sea so and just finishing here thank you for your time and thank you professor arun uh, just uh, i will invite you to join us on the table for the final debate and perhaps we can open the time to to, to have some questions uh, here or in the audience or even try to uh, op uh, respond or answer the, the debate or the question that um, Professor Arun opened about the possibility to have this kind of in-situ um, biolabs in the uh, overseas uh, in Europe. Uh, there is some questions on in the audience here about the presentation that we have today. Looking, yeah. Uh, sorry, can you come to the... Yes? Can I come? Shall I stop here? Yep. Okay. One question. Uh, when you analyze the, the carbon mm -hmm. from the meadow, um, how do you do? You cut the rhizome and then you dry them. You're only considering the rhizome and the roots? or Everything, basically. And the, and the yeah, leaves also? Yes, well, not, not the leaves, it's basically the, bil the below ground compartment. This includes rhizomes, roots. Um, we, we, all, we first have to remove all, you know, for example, the shells of any marine animal. So just okay. to concentrate on, the, on what the seagrass is providing. Okay, okay. Right? And then you just uh, burn it and just take the orga it. organic carbon? And we get organic carbon, exactly. Okay. And we, we, there, there are a couple of already published mathematical formulas. Right for different groups of seagrass meadows, so you okay. can convert the, the the organic carbon into how much carbon there is. Right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gerson, I have a question for you, and well, it's two questions already in the net for you. The first one is: uh, Inta can only be set up with the specific species, or could be implemented using a variety of species? present at different geographical locations? Okay. Um, IMTA has been, uh, I mean, IMTA exists and has been taking place in Asia for hundreds of years because it was a natural way that the people were producing their uh, water resources, freshwater, marine water. I mean, this it existed naturally and it was not called IMTA. It was just the way people were producing their their um, their species. Um, but then when the concept was given and it started in like around 2004 and it was um, put together by Thierry Chopin. And um, here, the, the most of the IMTA example that we have uh, have been, have taken place in the northern hemisphere, therefore with certain species, and most of them are salmon, kelp, mussels. So that's the example that come to mind when when people are thinking about integrated multitrophic aquaculture. But the integrated multitrophic aquaculture uh, in itself is not a recipe; is not given only for the species. It can be. It's a concept and it can be applied to any species you have around the globe. So any species that you are producing in any region, if they are from different trophic levels, they can be produced together. And then there's still, of course, with all these new species, you have to um, still do the research of how much nutrients one trophic level is producing how much the other one is capable to integrate so this has to be done for the new species that will be produced in the different region but it can be applied to any species from any traffic level around the globe i mean and therefore that's why it's interesting because that means that if you want to develop an imda in a region where you have no salmon or no kelp you don't have to start producing salmon or kelp that are not originally from this region. No, you can take one of your local species and reproduce the, the system. Okay, and looking to the context where you are speaking in terms of ORs, for you, what is the main bottleneck uh, to the implementation of INTA in these regions? Starting from Canary Islands, for example, and then 
Uh, um, if you know in other here I mean in the Canary Island until now uh, one of the main bottleneck has been um, in part administrative because of the way the licenses are given because normally when you ask for an aquaculture license to the administration they give you one license for one species so that means that if you're a producer and you want to set up an IMTA system and you have three different species that you want to integrate together, that means that you're going to have to do three times the work and ask three different uh, permits in order to set it up. So that's one of the things which does not make things uh, easy in order to develop it. And do you think this is the same problem that they have in other regions? Um, I, up to now, uh, the only example that I have where um, this has been taken into account, for example, is in uh, Madeira. If you ask for uh, one license for one species, uh, within this license you can include any other different species that you want on the condition that they are from a different trophic level. Okay. And that's the only example that I know of where they've considered these differences in trophic level uh, in order to be able to put it. So if I ask to produce C brim in Madeira, and I want on the same uh, and in the same location to add patella. Uh, I can because it's not from the okay. same traffic law, and I don't have to ask another another okay. permit. We have another question from the audience. Uh, uh, it is talk, talking about ecosystem services. Are these clearly established for different aquaculture species? What is required to estimate them for aquaculture and more specifically in the context of INTA? We should do it together, no? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Probably you, you can... Maybe you can answer first or you can and then I can... take the other micro. No, go ahead, go there, go there, and I'll go and take the other one. Well, I don't think the ecosystem services concept can be directly applied to aquaculture production, you know, because all ecosystem services are underpinned by ecosystem functions, you know, regulation, support, cultural, and this kind of thing. So I don't, I don't think, see, I don't, I mean, you have another jargon, or another way to quantify these kind of things following more traditional aquaculture approaches, you, you know, that rather than use that applying the ecosystem service. But for example, if you have the extractive species, I mean, these ones... Yeah, but you, have, you estimate the production of the species, right? But you could estimate the amount of effluence they can ingest, ah. or you can estimate the amount of CO2 they can capture, yes. or if you yes. can... Yeah. No? Yeah, it will be very local. Yeah, yeah, but you potentially can be done. Yeah, and do you know if this has been done for different no. aquaculture extractive species? No, yeah. no, no. no. It there has been... Some, there are some report by the FPO, for example, about yes. the... Aquaculture as a, uh, yeah, I use Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm not aware, you know, of the aquaculture literature because when I deal with this concept, it's more in, in nature. Just a complementary, a complementary comment. F A O. Okay. 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 Yeah. Sí. Yes. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. All right. So there are some reports by the IUCN, for example, that uh, taking account of the blue carbon capture by by aquaculture species from 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 fishes or from mussels or from other type of even from seaweeds. So they can you can make a calculation of a certain area and get a number of uh, carbon that is fixed by those that are crop or yeah use extractive aquaculture. So you have a similar to the similar to the numbers you were calculating about the fisheries uh, year year and year data. So that's a very similar approach. But it's, it's still in um, less uh, developed that uh, ecosystem services from natural ecosystem. So this so this could be I mean, in the concept of the IMTA, which was the rest of the question, you could use these data in order to associate it with any uh, fed species production mm -hmm. in order to do the calculation in an IMTA concept of 
the ecosystem services you would have or the extractive one and how they would be able to balance the one from the fed species right yeah okay right. okay uh no questions for now uh, from the audience but i have just a reflection i would like to ask to professor arun is regarding uh, about the networks uh, the in-situ labs that you presented so in your opinion, what is the best strategy uh, for ORs? Try to develop their own uh, in situ labs network or try to join uh, continental ones which are already working? Well, um, it's, it's a tricky question to say that way, but, but in the sense that uh, could be could be more easy to in integrate in the already existing network, but already existing network are set up for a certain geographical condition and more or less for a certain objective. And in at present time, with the current situation of Horizon Europe and the, and the consortium we do have in, in forward, I think there is a much better approach to develop this uh, living network uh, concept among the other region. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that uh, this uh, network is not uh, open for collaboration with uh, third countries or collaboration with uh, scientists coming from other regions outside France, Spain, or Portugal. And it's not it's not that way, but it's more that we do have already, and I think as I mentioned before, maybe in Arditi, maybe in Synergy, or maybe in, in Fondo Regional in Tecnología and Azores, they already have some idea of how they can support or how they can promote the local institutions working on marine science. And I think it will go in, doing those actions together, the different Audemars region, we are more strong as as I, my rector says, if you go alone, you go fast. If you go together, you go longer or yeah, more more distant. You can get more more benefits from from going together. So I think going together, the outermost region, and probably through the committee of the region, or probably through the regional government funds, we can try to define that uh, living living labs. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Arun. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions or any comments uh, regarding the presentations or general reflections about this, these last days. I have one comment, again, uh, just uh, regarding or linked to the Fernando presentation because I was quite surprised about the quality of the work and. Uh, just wondering is this level of uh, detail is also implemented in other ORs? Have you any information about the ecosystem service, uh, yeah, marine ecosystem service uh, mapping, we can say, is already implemented in, in another ORs in terms of, for example, mm, blue carbon or... I, I, I'm not aware about the, the mapping because the mapping would be, you know, a step forward, you know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think this first step would be just to ev evaluate the ecosystem function and as far as I'm concerned, there are a couple of places, I think, in, I think in the Caribbean, where they have been assessing the carbon stock of, provided by some seagrass uh, meadows. But keep in mind that it also depends on the type of seagrass, for example, because you need long life, big, large size species to, to store a lot of carbon. So, for example, with Alophila, it's a little bit more tricky to to obtain the, the final value because the, there is no so much accumulation or bury into into the sediment. So it all depends. But yeah, I've, I've, I've been reading a couple of different papers from different, you know, okay. uh, regions, particularly with the first evaluation, which is the, as I said before, the ecosystem function, which is the first step if we want to estimate the final ecosystem service. So it's a different step. So first you describe from an ecological perspective, the ecosystem function, and then you can estimate the, the ecosystem service, and you finally provide uh, a monetary evaluation. So okay. there are a couple of different steps, right? Okay. But something that is also amazing for me is that you are working about it, something like, uh, in terms of bathymetrical gradient, in the first, we can say, 30 meters of depth. Yes. And in a context of island environments, probably in terms of ecosystem services value for an archipelago like ours, 
uh, we can say that the value of the ecosystem service is uh, perhaps still 100 mm. meters can can be amazing. So big, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think it has to, it's very important to estimate, you know, in particular this this type. I mean, this uh, death range because it's where we encounter a lot of different human activities that can affect provision of these ecosystem services, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly in regions like Canary Island, where we have a massive amount of different activity, human activities that can, you know, somehow erode the provision of these ecosystem services. Yeah. You know, I'm sure, you know, in the, in the next couple of years, it's going to be a very valuable tool for people working with marine spatial planning. Because yes. at the end, you can get exactly. these very fancy maps, you know, that any stakeholder or any politician or any manager can work out which are, for example, the priority areas for conservation. And if I do this thing here, what is going to happen with the provision of this of this ecosystem service? So, in terms of the of data decision make t taken, I think is is a is going to be a very very big uh, step forward. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, oh. <laughs> that that means that you would have to have such estimation for all different kinds of habitats? Yes, of course, that, 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 that's the idea. Okay. Yeah. But, and keep in mind that, for example, here around our island, we've got seagrass meal, but we also have rhodolites mid um, bottoms, or we have rocky reefs, or we have black, black coral forests. So there is, there is a lot of ecological background knowledge first, first of all. Just the mapping is a massive work, you know, it's a, and it's a very big investment in terms of resources, right? So, it all, it's like, you know, a, a, it's, it's like a domino with different steps, right? And you have to go step by step, but at the end, I think you can provide this. And as I said before, I think that in terms of people working with marine and spatial planning, is it would be fantastic. And then there is another issue, is the connectivity with habitats. So, perhaps you will affect one habitat and it's connected with the other. And then well, yeah, yeah. I it some, became yeah, complicated. Yeah, I somehow talked about this before, okay, because we, we know that these habitats are not static. They are very dynamic and they change. For example, before I, I spoke about, you know, when there is a transition from a seagrass meadow to a, a bottom dominated by, 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 sea green, uh, by a green sea, which there is an erosion of these ecosystem services. But at least we, we, we are getting this data. Right, but we we have to keep in mind that working in the sea is difficult. They are very dynamic. They change a lot, but we are getting every day. We are getting more and more data. Thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, Ricardo, do you think we can conclude or we can? Uh, no, I don't. Know. Do we have any other questions? Uh, not for the audience. No. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, we use. We are, have a historical record of a very good relationship among Azores, Madeira, and Canary Island. That uh, we are now realizing that there are already a biological corridor for many important species, from fisheries-related species to conservation uh, species, from from marine tartar to tuna, from cetaceans to other species are or even um, seabirds so that's a uh, one issue that uh, needs to be addressed on a large regional scale and as i said before the example of the macaronesa is, is okay but we can try to we can try and i think we need to think in a more larger scale in the caribbean there are somehow martinica guadalupe san martin and and Guyana Francesa are places that are in a different latitudinal gradient. They are more or less in the Caribbean Sea, but they are not exactly the same. So they have a, a quite a quite interesting geographical setting for compar comparative analysis of those type of action of connectivity among among the, the regions. And if I speak in a more large scale, we are connected with the Gulf Streams, the Caribbean and the Canary Island, and the Cape Cape Verde. So that's that's also a, a, a valuable seed. We have we have some marine turtles coming from to the Canary Island water that are, are not only coming from Cabo Verde but are also coming from Florida or from the Caribbean. So that's that's one example. And we don't know so much about that connectivity, but we do have connectivity, and we can try through this maybe living lab concept or more uh, close relationship with our. Uh, Colleagues in the other side of the Atlantic work on, on those type of uh, actions. Let me see if it's. 
Ah, there is one question for uh, Dr. Yeson. Uh, I will try to translate. Uh, uh, is this concept of IMTA uh, applicable now for a kind of industrial level? So you present some kind of research level, but is applicable for industry now? Um, until, I mean, for the, 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 the referring to the question that was before when I was saying that the first concept that were tested were done in the northern hemisphere. For, for these species, we have really good data and some pilot scales have been set up at sea uh, or even on land and then but I mean we're talking pilot scale at, uh, at a commercial scale and um, so from these data you have some um, some companies that have uh, done it that have applied it and that have tested it at the commercial scale okay so for, for this it has been tested uh, for other species that would be newer species that would be tested in, uh, in uh, this IMTA system uh, these, they would need first an evaluation of the different uh, nutrient loads that are being produced or the different extractive possibilities of the species in order to be tested before being possibly applied in a, in a commercial scale. But for the, uh, the ones that were tested on the, at the beginning, uh, yes, various companies have tested them at, at commercial scale. Yeah, and you, have you tried at, uh, in your facilities to implement some kind of, we can say... Here in our facilities yeah. we are at a pilot scale that is similar to what could be found in a, in a commercial uh, company. We're, at, we're getting at a scale which is really pilot and... and but I think in the past have you already worked with the industry trying to implement some kind of or do some interaction in terms of no. In the past, we've we've done some tests uh, it, together with a fish farm that was uh, producing some fish, but and we've got some results. But the results would be only corresponding to the little amount of extractive species that we've been able to add to this. Mm -hmm. But that would not represent all the potential that that would have in order to mitigate the complete effect of the farm. Okay. Yeah, because it was done at small scale. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Perhaps we, we will try to, I will give the floor to, to Professor Ricardo Rung to conclude or, yeah, conclude the, this uh, journey. Uh, thank you, Fran. Um, it's a pleasure to close the, this three-day session, I would say, because uh, we have had the opportunity to see different perspectives on, on blue innovations, on activities that are being carried out by researchers from longer period or from shorter period, but uh, researchers that are being applying the, the knowledge on the, on the local condition of the, of the Canary, and I think that could be somehow uh, useful for other Odemos regions. Um, we will continue in, inside the forward to discuss more in detail the potential uh, action with maybe this living, as I said before, this living lab uh, concept or transforming in a more complex uh, <coughs> uh, approach with uh, networking activity with, within the, the Odemos regions. Uh, I have to... Sorry. I have to another com well that's more or less the, the, the main the main issue that I wanted to say about this uh, webinar. Um, thanks all the pres all the speakers because they have done a lot of effort and the and the organization we have been behind this uh, webinar. This uh, hybrid situation with some people in the room and some people in the in the screens uh, following the different activities. Um, in the thematic working group, we are going to continue de developing our action plans for the for the marine activity of how we can complement each other, how we can have a better how how we can have a, a better um, interaction among people in 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 the regions. So, so we know more or less some of the research, but we still need to have more um, close relationship with the other researchers in in 
in the Caribbean, in the Macaronesia, or in the Indian Ocean. Um, and as a final um, conclusion, um, well, I, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, today the rector of the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria that wanted to to be today here. He couldn't be in the, uh, due to the agenda in the in the opening uh, day, but uh, today is also quite important that he can uh, join us and perhaps uh, give a closing remark for the for the webinar. use the mask if you don't mind. So it's, a, it's my pleasure and honor to close this meeting on blue growth and sustainable exploitation of marine resources in the outer or small regions, which is aligned with the strong commitment of my government, the rectorate, to comply with the sustainable development goals. This morning I have particip I participated also in the opening remarks of the third uh, Canadian Congress on Blue Economy. So there are many, many things running away around uh, the blue economy. Uh, everyone agrees that an island is defined as a piece of land surrounded by water, by sea. From there, the disagreements begin. But what is evident and unavoidable is that the island people live surrounded by water. In other words, in other words, we island people cannot be more blue, and we have no choice but to be blue. That is also an advantage. That it is clear that applied marine research focus on island system allow us to better understand the current and potential uses of the marine and environment, environment that are the central characteristics, characteristics of an island territory. Moreover, islands are also laboratories for testing models and solutions for other coastal realities. Just recently, we had the opportunity to learn that a country like Norway, which celebrated its International Week at our university just a few weeks ago, due to its peculiar layout, has more kilometers of coast coastline than all the Iberian Peninsula. And there is no doubt that the advances, advances that we achieve here might also have some applications in that country as well as in many other coastlines not necessarily only islands. However, it's, it's evident that building strong alliance, alliances between islands is a very important commitment. But we should try to not die in this alliance. I mean, the Macaronesia is a very important issue, but we should try to go straight away. For this reason, it's not by chance that this event is part of the forward project that is developed with all the other most regions of the European Union, coordinated by the, the Spanish, the Canadian Agency, and whose objective is to develop and strengthen its own research structures in each and every one of those European regions. The ULPGC actively participate in this project with the support of the Office of European Projects and in the scientific part, more specifically within the working group of marine science and technologies. Sustainable blue growth initiatives affect multiple areas from governance to coastal spatial planning to conservation of the coastline and the marine environment 
aquaculture and marine biotechnologies, all of them perfectly framed in the European Blue Growth Strategy and the other related European directives. I am uh, really impressed with the uh, different speech that you have been done in this conference, which uh, is mainly to, due to different participators, professors of uh, Equaqua and other institutes from our university. I think that we have a, in, in, the, in the ULPGC we have a unique opportunity to build together this uh, Eco Aqua with the EOACG, TDES, UMAI, UOSI, the, the different institutes that are working around the blue economy. And, and we should be able to, to work a, a big hub on all these, uh, among all these structures, also involving, obviously, the School of, of uh, Sea Science and other schools in the engineering, like the Naval Engineering and another one. The interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity necess necessary, necessary to face the important challenge that we face is reflected in the issues addressed for marine pollution by microplastics, new trends in uh, microalga production, circular economy, diversification of aquaculture spe species, the welfare of marine animals, artisanal fisheries, coral forest, and biodiversity, and many, many other aspects that may have been the object of a singular detection in this short that enriching scientific meeting. I thank the director of EcoAqua, Ricardo, Professor Ricardo Arun, and all the organizers, uh, all the professors and participants of these uh, important sessions. Muchas gracias a todos los ponentes y a participantes en las distintas sesiones. Y a ustedes por su, por su atención, eh, me tienen a su disposición para, que, para lo que pueda colaborar y, y empujar desde el rectorado, porque pienso que es una de las áreas fundamentales de nuestra universidad y de nuestro futuro. So, thank you very much for your attention and that's all. So, so we, we officially close this uh, this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>